Can you sing it now? 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 Catchy new tune, isn't it, Professor? It is. It is. Hey, we switched sides. Oh, we did. That's weird. We did. That's um, weird. Welcome back to Philosophy for the People, everybody. It is Freaky Friday. We will be doing our Q&A as always. Uh, but first, we want to talk about a theme that is familiar to both Jim and I, and yeah. that is having a big family and the benefits yeah. of having a big family in modern society when that is not always encouraged. So I'm looking forward to this, seeing what uh, the comes out of this conversation around the philosophy of, of having a gazillion children. Uh, but before we get into it, man, what's, uh, what's new and what's shaking? Oh, not much, man. Uh, just, uh, had a workout this morning, uh, and, uh, you know, broke my fast, had, had a meal, had a nice protein shake. Now mm. beating my afternoon pot of coffee. <laughs> so. Good. Do you, uh, do you caffeinate throughout the day or do you have like a, a cutoff? Uh, I caffeinate as long as I'm awake. Wow, dude. So you're you're like my wife then. She can do she can yeah. have a cup of coffee right before bed, no issue. Yeah. I have to I have to cut it off like now. Around yeah. if I if I have caffeine past noon, it'll start messing with my sleep. Mm -hmm. I used to I used to be where I couldn't even have like a Coke after three o'clock in the afternoon. Um now I pretty much shut it down by like four thirty, five o'clock. I don't really have any caffeine after that. Because I do think it would start to get to me there. Right. Yeah. Especially if I'm gonna train hard at night you know so then i get a big adrenaline dump and there's still caffeine in the system mm, that's pretty bad for me for sleep so are, are you a early bedtime kind of guy are you a night owl yeah i'm i'm a i'm a in bed like a sleep by 10 up by five guy okay yeah so you're, you're yeah. grandpa jim i'm i'm grandpa grandpa, jim. I'm, I'm grandpa flynn so yeah. i get that yeah. yeah i'm almost always in bed before 10 um yeah ex except last night uh because boy yeah i'm de i'm deep tired but in a good way i'm, I'm it's an yeah. exciting thing because i'm deep tired because there's a lot of really good things going on of course we welcomed briga our newest child uh into the world just this week so that's that's magnificent and uh it's you know relevant to the conversation we're going to be having that's number five for us gentle listeners number five and then uh, we got the big gig, the one that I know everybody in the show has been waiting for. Uh, that's the Waukesha County Fair this weekend. That's right, uh, gentle listeners. Pat Flynn's band, Four on the Floor, <laughs> is going to be playing there tomorrow. Ted Nugent is actually opening up for us tonight. So he was kind enough to uh, open up for us on the on the yeah. day before the, before we play. So if anybody's yeah. in the Waukesha area, you want to come hear some shreddy guitar solos coming out to the county fair tomorrow. But man, rehearsal was and like And while you're rehearsal. there, you might as well hang around and see Ted. So... Yeah, you, yeah, you could check him out too. But uh, yeah, we had like a five-hour rehearsal last night because we've had a download. It's a three-hour set, which is ridiculous. It's ridiculous. So we've had to download an enormous amount of tunes in a short amount of time, and it went late. So you're gonna all that to say, Jim's gonna carry a lot of this episode today. Sure. But so let's not sure. delay. Let's get into it, man. Tell us what you had on your mind of talking yeah. about the philosophy of having a gazillion kids. The yeah, you know, so mm -hmm. we've talked about this before. You know, I, I was struck this week, uh, quite a. Well, I mean, I've been struck by this theme a lot for the last two years since uh, my oldest son left home. Um, and now just this summer, you know, there's a, another a friend of the show, I.J. Markham, uh, just had his, his his first child. He and his wife had their first child this week. A beautiful situation for there. They've overcome a lot of suffering to get there and all that. Mm -hmm. um, and then you had a child this week. And uh, right now I and my wife and my and my kids, my two two oldest remaining at home kids, Martha and Patrick, are in the throes of trying to get visas arranged for them to move to Europe. Right? Yeah. Um, and I was just, it was, it's, I've been struck quite a bit how you know, even though you have a kid, kids in in a, in a broad range, right? You're old. How old is Omar? We have um, oldest is eight. He'll be nine eight, in October, yeah. and then just go down yeah. by twos to the most recent, right? And mm -hmm. so I'm, I'm entering the last stage, right? Mm -hmm. And you're kind of like overlapping with the early stage and the middle stage of right. parenthood, right? In, in, especially in having a larger family, right? Mm -hmm. And, you know, our, my friend, IJ, uh, whom, you know, kind of got me into the podcasting thing, is, he's just now on the cusp. He's like, mm -hmm. just jumped into the sea, right? And uh, so that just uh, parenting in that, in, as like a process has been on my mind quite a bit, right? And, you know, something I think we've talked about on the show before, 
and I, I know you agree with me on this, is, you know, first and foremost, one of the things that's really struck me as I've gotten into the backside of parenting, the, like the, the downslope, and, the, and not in the sense that's bad, but just in the final stretch, right, okay. is really, first and foremost, what, what being a parent is, is, uh, you know, a responsibility to the, to the person that you have now, like, gotten into this mess that is human life, okay, mm -hmm. so it's, it, it's a responsibility to the children, right? But also, it's a responsibility to human civilization, mm -hmm. right? Right, and not not just like we think of that responsibility quite a bit in terms of, uh, you know, you have this responsibility not to turn like terrible people loose onto uh, onto civilization. That's true. Okay, that's true. Um, but I think more positively, I think we have to remember like what parenthood is is your taking responsibility that there be another generation of human civilization. Yes. Right? yes. You know I mean? It's, uh -huh. it's not oh, just mm -hmm. don't screw it up. It's that it, it's that for it to be at all presupposes that there are going to be children. Right. Mm -hmm. And they will be trained in that civilization. Yes. Yes. That, right? mm -hmm. And, and, you know, increasingly I see people who are refusing parenthood, right. Or deeply deprioritizing it to other ends. Right as sort of shirking that responsibility to human civilization yeah right? Mm -hmm. right it's 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 a denial of the fact that we all come into this world whether we like it or not in a kind of debt right yes right and i, and I know a lot of us hey you didn't ask to be born i get that right but here's the deal you were and the the very possibility of a good human life presupposes that you're accepting this civilization that was given to you that's right. right. That's right. Mm -hmm. Okay. And then to say, hey, I'm going to renounce that happening again, mm -hmm. right? Seems to me to be like the most selfish act, one of the most selfish acts. Yeah. Yeah. Like yeah. yeah. I'll be provocative, yeah. man. I think that um, it's no surprise that there's so much selfishness and I would even say narcissism suffused with the sort of contraceptive and certainly abortive culture, right? And yeah. just large amounts of general viciousness, right? Lack yeah. of lack of control, lack of temperance, yeah. uh, egoism, all that stuff, right? It's all, I mean, it makes sense, right? I mean, yeah. if you think about human nature and you give yourself endless opportunities to just indulge your animal appetites and never yeah. any opportunities for sacrifice or self-restraint, what sort of outcome do you think would come from this? Right. That you, aside from you just continue to collapse uh, more in a nasty way into yourself, start using other people as objects rather than recognizing them as ends and retreating from your both proximate obligations you have to other people and the global obligations yeah. as well so how's that for yeah. the, the cluster of claims mm -hmm. no no I, I and i agree with what you're saying there and in in 100 percent and even leaving aside the like the, the moral worries right you know it's like so in renouncing the kind of self-sacrifice that that parenthood is right um though i even i want to talk about even the notion of self-sacrifice there for a second right but right but in renouncing that, like you're, like you're really, like you're denying yourself this sort of disciplining of your own desires for the sake of another, which is going to have downstream consequences in terms of all of our behavior and stuff like that. Mm -hmm. 100, I agree with that. Um, and for me, though, what I want to emphasize, though, is I think to deny parenthood of yourself, right? Okay, is to like deeply misunder mischaracterize human nature, right? Mm. It's like to mischaracterize. The historical temporal status of being human right mm -hmm. you see what i mean like 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 we it 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 ignores the fact that you got thrown into a historical moment and you owe everything almost everything to that historical moment yeah do you mm -hmm. see that and then to and then to say that somehow uh i'm just not going to participate in in the, another run of this right I think it's this like just delusional sense of independence, right? Yeah, it, it, yeah. it is all it is all a moral dimension still, though, right? Because you know people just don't think of the different lines of the moral dimension. Like, yeah, we think of the the moral dimension of you know me not uh, being nasty to you, Jim, right? Yeah. But there's also a moral dimension that's vertical to God and to society and yeah. to the nation and to history <laughs> and to history. That's my point. And that's yeah. what you're talking yeah. about. That's what I want to bring out. That's absolutely yeah. right. Totally. And uh -huh. and so there one there's like there's a mm -hmm. and actually Robert Brandom's like recent stuff is very interesting. It's like there is a kind of responsibility you bear to history. Yes. Right? Okay. Right. Uh, -huh. uh And moreover, I think it's it's also just to fail to understand yourself and what you are. Mm -hmm. Right. It's a fail to understand your his, historical being, right? 
and and to like live in a kind of constant denial of it right right um you, you see that and 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 so also this another important thing i really this really kind of got me going this morning i was thinking about what i want to talk about in this episode is um so right now uh you know my my children are, are, are leaving right okay so by by september three of my six are gone right there's three at home okay so i'm like literally in the between here right at the middle point of it okay mm -hmm. and you know I'm, i've been very struck lately how um my deceased father is functionally a memory to me now mm -hmm. Do you, you know what i mean it's it, it's uh as, as i like to put it, he's it's almost like he's a dream right is a dream that I, I can't fully 100% recall, but yet kind of I can see it colors everything for me. Yes. Right? Yeah. Uh -huh. Okay. Uh, and also, like my kids' childhood, in a lot of ways, is this like this shared dream the eight of us had—my six kids, my wife, and me. Right. That's it's kind. It's not here anymore, mm -hmm. but it colors, it imbues everything now. Right. right? It, it informs. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it informs. Right. But also, I'm realizing, you know, uh, I'm becoming a memory to my children. Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? Like, like every step they move into a world that's not directly mine anymore, right? That their present has less in common with my present, right? Though we have this like shared past, you know what I mean? The more and more I'm going to be like a memory to them. And someday I will be a memory to them. Right, I hope so. Right. I hope mm -hmm. so. I hope I go first, right? Mm -hmm. Do you know what I mean? And so what I'm getting at here is like this, this, in this kind of refusal of parenthood, right? Mm -hmm. Is this refusal to live between the past and the future, right? To see the present as extended through those two things, it's also a denial of mortality, right? Mm -hmm. I mean, I think this is my this is my like unprovable sociological claims. I think a lot of the aversion, you get one of those a day. That's over one a day, right? Yeah, mm -hmm. uh, a lot of the aversion that you see to parenthood out there, right, uh, is not just this refusal of commitment or refusal of responsibility. It's it's just utter inauthenticity with respect to death. Mm, right it's mm -hmm. other it's on inauthenticity with respect to mortality right mm -hmm, excuse mm -hmm. me but because think of like, like you just you just saw a child come into the world you know or come from the womb right yeah there is yeah. there is no way you can see that and not realize holy crap we're a kind of animal uh yeah yeah dude, you, especially you, when you see yeah. and uh, and i think i told you Brigitte was an on yeah. on call birth i don't know if i'm pronouncing yeah, that right yeah, it's french yeah. so like literally yeah. born in the amniotic sac yeah. crazy right Crazy. I mean, beautiful, and, but crazy. Yeah. Uh -huh. Childbirth is one of the very few truly primal experiences left to us. Right. Yeah. Uh, well, you know it's I mean? primal, especially yeah. at home birth. And, man. Especially <laughs> you and I are just spectators on it. You know, right. Yeah. You know, God bless our wives. Right. Yeah. And so, but what do you like, like by seeing that you cannot help, but see, we are connected to a, not just a, a cultural past, but a biological past. Right. Mm. We are, mm -hmm. we're the latest generation of this kind of animal. You know, whatever our ultimate fate is, this this is a fact that cannot be denied, and I think that sense of human animal mortality it pervades the experience of of parenthood, right? Because you know, if you're authentic about this, like the, man, the clock is ticking on this. These people are going to pass through your life, and you're passing through theirs, and they will survive you, right? Like 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 they reveal your finitude to you. Do, do you yeah. see that, mm -hmm. right? Oh yeah. But but in a way that it's it's not horrific. It's like, well, no, like this, this is the point I'm here to carry the ball, pass it to them. And then they'll take it up. I love, I love how you, you said should, it's not yeah. horrific. It's actually beautiful and suffused yeah. with so much significance. It really yeah, is. Right. Exactly. It really wakes you up yeah. from your, from your dogmatic slumbers. Right? Exactly. Uh -huh. And so yeah. I, I see the renunciation of parenthood is this renunciation of the temporal structure of human beings. Yeah, right. Mm -hmm. That we are temporal animals. It, we it, live it, with a sense of time, and parenthood is what really brings it to us. Yeah, that's so good. To yeah. to renounce parenthood is really to just want to live perpetually as a child. I'll go ahead mm -hmm. and say that. Yeah, yeah it's to live. It, it's to it's to try to grasp at a present, right? Mm -hmm. Okay, like what do children want to do? They want to live for the present and nothing more, right? Right. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, they they you know they don't they don't, don't want to be held to a past, and they don't want to necessarily look to a future. They just want this now, right? Right. Uh -huh. Well, parenthood does not afford you that. Right. You, you're admitting you're taking something up, you know, a consequence of something that happened before. And you're and you're always thinking of the future possibility of these people for good or ill. Right. And so you have to take the the irreducible temporality of human experience seriously there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Now, before anyone thinks that I'm I'm being too preachy, which maybe I am, let me let me remind people of my history. You know, I didn't start out as a saint who wanted to, you know, yeah. 
follow all church teachings and have a big family. You know, I, <laughs> I, was, I was not a religious person when I first got with, with Christine and we lived far from holy lives, but she got pregnant, right? And I often said, you know, I've, I had many, philosoph I, many philosophical confusions and mistakes in my life, um, but I was always pro-life, right? I was always, so as soon as she was pregnant, um, it was nothing aside from, yeah, we're having this. We're absolutely having this baby. Yep. Um, but what I realized is, Jim, what you said is true, man. Once that baby came into the world, I was forced with, with a dilemma. Either I was going to grow up because I had a kid quite young, right? Either yep. I was going to grow up really fast and and like seriously decrease or stop these ridiculously narcissistic and selfish tendencies that I did have. Right. Yeah. And realized I have a responsibility here that unlike many other things in my life, I can't just kind of ignore anymore. Right. So I've said it before, like becoming a parent makes it so you cannot stay the same, no matter right. what you're going to have to become a better person. Or if you try to stay the same, you're automatically worse. Right. Yes. Yes. It is, it is a moral fork in the road Yep. And it's an opportunity. Christine calls all of our kids. She, I love, she, she calls them our little sanctifiers, right? Yeah. Constant opportunities to grow in, in virtue, to bind yourselves in moral community. Uh, I love the way that you're talking about memory, right? Like what a, what a great responsibility, what a great honor uh, to be able to play this sort of role of bringing, like, I just think about that with, with break like, holy, holy vulgarity. Like we just brought this human into the world right like that's a crazy thing especially when you yeah. see it like but what a great honor i said to christine like how awesome is it right that we in the you know get to play the role of secondary cause or forget all the fancy metaphysics we get to play the role of bringing another human into the world that's crazy right <laughs> but that's also awesome and the opportunities that come from that if you pay attention are the best opportunities that life has to offer uh no doubt it took me a while uh, to really fully appreciate that. But the longer I've been a parent and the more kids I have, not only do I appreciate it more, but the more seriously I try yeah. to take my role as a parent and yeah. the obligations I have, not just to my kids, but as society at large. Like, yes, I want my kids to be amazing, holy, beautiful, wonderful children, healthy, happy in all the ways. But I also know that they need to be good members of society. Now, as it happens, these things are mutually compatible, right? You focus on one, you tend to you tend to get the other. And then, of course, it goes back to you, too, right? That's what makes you a better person. The self-giving that you give to your kids to form them as good citizens makes you a good citizen, right? I mean, this is just sort of the structure of the world, right? And if you work along these the lines of natural law, it's everybody sort of wins out on this. But unfortunately, people don't work along those lines because of everything that you've just been articulating right, right. These, these, right. This, this lack of interest and responsibility and wanting to be perpetually a child and all that sort of stuff yeah mm -hmm. you know and, and i uh, yeah i've been lucky i i have not experienced uh parenthood as a kind of burden right mm -hmm. okay but you know i've i've been i've been blessed in a lot of ways too um with a, a lot of bumps in the road in, in parenting right like we've we've had an almost fairy tale easy time of it right mm -hmm. um but and you know it's not over yet i still have half of them at home yet right okay but um i have not seen it as a burden right mm -hmm. and in fact i don't even like and i'm not criticizing its use but i i try not to indulge talk of self-sacrifice about parenting okay because that that presumes a kind of individualism that i deny right mm -hmm, mm -hmm, it mm -hmm. presumes that there was like some other option that was better right? for you yeah like i'm right. giving something up for for this right, right? yeah you yeah you gave yeah. up yeah what you might have given up was a want but it was yeah. a disordered one it wasn't yeah. a need it, it, it wasn't as if a need, the default right? position of being a human animal is not taking responsibility for another generation mm, right mm -hmm. do you know what I mean like it's not a self-sacrifice of mine you know to like go through the ordinary human developmental process that ultimately and you know that that, that will have will see me go you know from being a child to you know peak adulthood and then decline into death that's not a self-sacrifice that's just how it goes right, right. okay mm -hmm. well in the same way i don't see parenthood as a self-sacrifice it's just how it goes for the kind yeah. of being right. that we are do you see what i mean yeah, yeah. Uh, which is I, which is right yeah. when i think you see it through the proper lens we see the, it through the proper lens but yeah that's that's yeah. the lens we're trying to get yeah. in front of us right and, now, right? and it's mm -hmm. only because we've we've presented ourselves with these other pseudo options for living 
right? Yeah, pseudo options. Um, yeah. But we act as the, as if those are the default ones, mm -hmm. and you have to have a good reason to give those up for this other thing, right? Right, right. Uh -huh. I don't see it that way at all, right? Yeah. I see it that the natural default is that one, you know, unless you've like come, come completely alienated from human bodily existence, one <laughs> one is body. Your very physical structure is designed to do this, mm -hmm. right? And uh, to think that somehow that's not the default is just, it's like this great, one of the great confusions of modernity. Yeah. That's right. And like, of, of course, we want to acknowledge that people have difficulties with this because of oh, various, yeah, sure. various issues, but you can always become a spiritual mother, a spiritual father, yeah. right? Those, yeah. those are real and significant roles as well. Yeah. Um, there's, it, it, so I love the, as always, I love the angle you took on this, Jim. Is there anything else you want to hit um, from that aspect or should we get to the other fun benefits of having a big family, such as always having a kickball team on the ready? That's true. Uh, that's true. Yeah, yeah, no, right. no, that's good. Yeah. Or uh, <laughs> man, I, I, it has been many years since I paid for a babysitter. Right. Yeah. Right. <laughs> always got your babysitter. So you have yeah. a certain age, always have a kickball team ready, which we take yeah. actually yeah. quite frequent advantage of. Um, yeah. always have a crowd for your local cover band. How about that? Exactly, right? You're exactly, never having exactly. a, you never, yeah. have, you never right. have an empty crowd out there. Yeah. Right. Yeah. We played at a bar not too long ago and yeah, my family kind of flooded the first little, it seemed like we actually had a fan base. How about that? Nice. That's <laughs> awesome. That's awesome. The kids have t-shirts, right? right. Yeah. 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 Yeah, always you know, always have sparring partners, always have other musicians to jam with. You just you're never yeah. bored, man. I'm never bored. I mean, yeah, like I, I'm always busy I, with other projects, but I have so much fun with my kids. Yeah. We're always playing Mario Kart together. We're playing out we got great times outside and stuff we do together. You're just never bored, right? Yeah. Yeah. I, I'm I mean, I can always go to the garage and get my ass kicked by one of my kids on the mat. I mean, that's yeah. that's like that's increasingly a given. Yeah. yeah. And dude, yeah. what a cool thing it is when like your kid legitimately gets you on something for the first time, man. I oh, was gotcha. playing, I was playing, yeah. uh, the, we were playing Nintendo. We're all big Nintendo, uh, nerds. Um, it's not surprising cause I was, so it's like, sometimes like you're kind of surprised at your kids, but then like you shouldn't be cause like they are your kids after all. Like Mira, for example, is like super into legend of Zelda right now, which is one of my favorite games. I'm like, Oh, that's, that's so funny. She likes the same things I like. But it's like, well, duh, she's my kid. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It surprises me, but then like, why yeah, should exactly. that be surprising? Why exactly. should that be surprising, yeah. right? Yeah. But anyway, she she legit uh, beat me in uh, in uh, Mario Strikers the other day. That's awesome. Like, That's so awesome. Fun. All right. Getting a little lazy here. Uh, so should we do some Q&A now, Jim? Anything else yeah, you want to say it. about that No, theme? that's it. I just wanted to get awesome. that out. Uh, it, it'd been on my mind for a few weeks here. Yeah, awesome. So, awesome. And I see we have, we'll highlight the comments as we go along here. Yeah. Let me take this one first. Here's a good warm up. Jay Pronoba says, philosophy of people, Pat, what band do you cover? We cover lots of bands. So our upcoming set at the county fair is a three hour set. We've got everything from Joan Jett, ACDC, Guns N' Roses, Fleetwood Mac, Billy Joel, Metallica, uh, Ted Nugent's on there, um, uh, Linda Ronstad. Uh, Carlos Santana. So we are, we're all over the place. In fact, we're probably too schizophrenic in terms of a band. I was thinking the other day, like we need to like find a way to kind of unify all these very different types of songs. Cause honestly, the same person who like likes Metallica probably isn't the same person who likes the song walking in Memphis. Right. So yeah, that yeah, that that's yeah. Got to figure that one out. But yeah, we, yeah, that, yeah. yeah, we cover, we cover lots of different stuff. And you just, address that by the way you order the set so we're gonna have like a like a metal period but then you then you you might lose half the audience right you know so i almost like you go back and forth you know yeah it's it's hard honestly i just so with apologies to, get... to the kind of people who like walking from to, through memphis here yeah yeah no like and like i don't like walking through memphis, yeah, exactly. i'm, I'm, the, I'm yeah. the one who brings in the you know metallica and acdc tunes but uh, I was I was at a uh, a show the other day with the fan. It was fun. We brought the whole family out. There was this like this. It's called Music on the Hill. And we watched a, a band. It was great. And this band was really cool because they played a lot of different tunes across from a lot of different genres. But they made them all reggae, right? Okay. So they they had the unity behind the diversity. Yeah, yeah, it was very yeah, platonic, yeah. Jim, and it like and that. it worked. Yeah, like it worked. That, yeah. Mm -hmm. All right, let's uh, take some questions here. Our friend Julio had some. Uh, I saw your questions, Julio, on yesterday's uh, yeah. video, and I was going to make sure we get to them, but it seems like we have them again here. He wants to know, what is the relevance of the McDowell-Dreyfus debate, Jim, and which side do you lean towards? Cool. Let me actually 
Yeah, let me let me do another one by Julio first. I think will help me answer that okay. one. Yeah. Okay. Take it. So Julio asked this too. Um, how influential is Merleau Ponty in your thinking, and do you think he should be read more? Um, the answer is a great deal, and yes, <laughs> right. Um, so let me let me unpack a little bit. And, and yeah, and say for what reasons? Like, what do you yeah. think he has to offer to? So you know, okay. So things I've learned from Merleau Ponty, right? Um, and you know, these are also things that you could learn, you know, in various ways to various degrees in the later Husserl and the early Heidegger and such. But uh, I have found Merleau Ponty's articulation of things very, very helpful to me. Okay, so um, one, I, he he has led me to rethink a lot of just sort of what are taken as just truisms in contemporary philosophy of mind, especially about our access to qualia. Okay, mm -hmm. so for Merleau Ponty, even going back to earlier themes today, is even like the experience of qualia has a temporal aspect to it, right? You never just experience a patch of red, you experience a patch of red in that carpet that you've always hated in your office, right? Mm -hmm. Like your past, like, like there isn't just pure qualitative experience separated from like your showing up in the world embodied in a certain way, okay, with a certain history, okay. That lends it to the second point is like Merleau-Ponty really helped me to rethink what we mean when we say like human beings are minded but yet embodied, okay? And for Merleau-Ponty, uh, the body isn't just like a bag of physiologically oriented chemicals, right? For him, the body is a kind of history, right? Uh, it is it's a it is the sort of finitudizing limiter of human experience right it, it it's it's our embodiment that forces our experience to have a finite you know sort of like range do you, mm -hmm. you see that okay yeah uh, and i see merleau ponty in many ways as a philosopher making you take that the, the inherent finitude of human experience very seriously okay another thing very important about merleau ponty okay um for me is you know uh, hegel in um the beginning of the encyclopedia logic defines philosophy as, as the discipline um, that doesn't take its own beginnings as a given. Okay. So, uh, so what Hegel means there is like, like all the other disciplines kind of start out with a set of principles that they, they can't really justify within the bounds of that discipline. Right. right? Okay. Whereas for Hegel, what philosophy is, is the discipline that never solves, that never, that never um, settles for that. Right. right. It examines be, the foundations of everything else and itself. And right. itself. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So there's like this inherent self-referential uh you know, you know, aspect of philosophy for for Hegel, right? And Hegel thinks you can think of there's a there's a seemingly vicious circle going on there, right? And like Hegel thinks that has to be resolved. Okay. Um and for him the resolution of that will only come when you have this to refer to yesterday's episode, this great sublation of everything falls under a single rational rubric that we can see is non-optional, right? Mm -hmm. So we begin a contingency, we're gonna like find that all contingency turns out to be necessity in a way. Mm -hmm. Okay. Merleau Ponty agrees, like what it is to be philosophical, to be distinctively humanly rational is to like to return to your beginnings and put mm -hmm. them in critical scrutiny. But because we're embodied, because we're finite, there's no like great Hegelian end of history coming along to get us out of this. Mm -hmm. Do you see that? And so I think for me with, with Merleau Ponty is he's, he's helping me see what it would be like to take finitude seriously and still have the philosophical act. Right mm -hmm. to still to still have a transcendent philosophical attitude towards the world. Okay. Right, mm -hmm. does that make sense? Okay, so uh, that's what I take. Um, what I've what's really influenced me with, with Merleau Ponty, and he's all over. Like, if I could rewrite the new book head to toe, it would be different because I've learned more and more of Merleau Ponty as I've gone on writing it, and you can kind of watch. You can see like my attitude towards him kind of change in the footnotes throughout the book. But anyway. Um, now, why do I think he should be read more? Because I think those are all important truths, or at least important possibilities that we need to take seriously, right? Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, okay. And um, and so for that reason, I think he should be. He definitely needs to be read. Okay. Yeah. 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 Uh, I was okay. just going to say, maybe you yeah. want to bundle this with his other question of a yeah. phenomenology reading list, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. So let me let me go here though to this. Um, what is the relevance of the McDowell Dreyfus debate, and which side do you lean towards? Okay, I'm gonna I'm gonna give you like a quick and dirty, uh, like what is what is the McDowell Dreyfus debate? It is McDowell is Hegel, right, and Dreyfus is Merleau-Ponty. Okay, Dreyfus and Taylor, really. Mm -hmm. Okay, 
are, are like suggesting something like Merle, Merle Pati's views. Okay. And for both of them, it like, it comes down to a question of like, like they're both McDowell and Dreyfus are realists of a sort. Okay. Mm -hmm, but mm -hmm. the question is like, what actually gives us contact to the world, right? Is it ultimately what we're doing in this abstracted space of reasons, right? Which would be McDowell, right? Or is it our precognitive, right? But still distinctively human, uh, practical, embodied contact with the world. Do, do you, okay, so so the the debate is interesting and important because it's a question of like what actually gives us a grip on reality, mm -hmm, right? Mm -hmm. Is it is it the once again like kind of the the abstracted rational act, or is it this prior skillful coping embodied thing? Okay, mm -hmm. um, I actually in the new book am trying to say uh, one need not pick one. Okay, that in fact the two views ultimately um, can be seen as compatible when properly understood, right? Um, which, if you watch this series episode, you'd see that that was a very Hegelian attitude to have towards mm -hmm. it. Right? So, okay, all right. There was another one. Now you you said phenomenology um, reading list. So Julio, you're getting your money's worth today, my yeah, friend. man. Julio, my man. We're okay. Phenomenology reading list. Um, Okay, in a lot of ways, I want to be careful of this because I am a mostly autodidact in that whole area of the world. Okay, um, in terms of primary sources, one of the problems is this stuff is really hard. Okay, uh, but well, let me men yeah. make one quick okay. mention. Uh, I'm still working through it, so I haven't um, formulated all my final judgments about it yet. But so far, Mark Spencer's new book on the irreducibility of human person is really good, and it is suffused with phenomenology and has great is itself a great introduction to a cool. lot of phenomenological thought. So I'll just throw that one out. Yeah. There, right. Very mm -hmm. good. Um, yeah. So if I'm going to recommend like a, uh, especially Merle Ponty, right. If, if I'm mm -hmm. recommending a secondary source to get into it, uh, John Salas has two short books of lectures he gave on Merle Ponty in the seventies, which I think have been recently made available again. Um, gosh, in the title. So the first one, which is on Merle Ponty's earlier work is, um, called logos of the sensible world right mm -hmm. and his second one which i think is a, is a masterpiece in its own right is uh called was it philosophy in the return to beginnings by john yeah. salas right mm -hmm. so i would check those out for a starter on merlo ponty I, okay. I would also recommend i'm not as well read in phenomenology as jim but i did find introduction to phenomenology by sokolowski really yep. good Right. Sokolowski's book is very good too, right? Mm -hmm. um, I also like, uh, there's a Gallagher and Zahavi, Zavi, uh, have a book called um, uh, The Phenomenological Mind, which is an introduction to phenomenology and cognitive science and philosophy of mind, which is pretty interesting stuff, right? Mm -hmm. um, but other than that, in terms of primary sources, then, you know, I, I think you, you got to get, <laughs> just go get the big, big, hard German and French books and start chipping <laughs> away, right? You know, that's there's only, that's what I did. That's what I did. Good man. luck, I, yeah. I got into phenomenology as part of a midlife crisis. So if I can do mm -hmm. it, if I could do it with my old, like 42 year old brain when I started doing it, you right. guys can do it. Yeah. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Awesome. Good stuff. All right. Good stuff. Julio, good questions and hope we provided a somewhat satisfactory answer. Let's uh, keep it going, guys. Keep sending what you have. Um, one more from Julio. He said, Pat, will you upload videos from the concert? If somebody films clips, I'll definitely upload them. I've got a few clips on my Facebook page from some of the previous ones there. Nothing nothing long or too fancy, but it's they, they exist. All right, let's come back up here. Uh, Mount Athos and Aquinas Fellowship says, congrats, Pat, on the new addition to the family. We have our third on the way. Congrats to you, my friend. We're praying for you guys. So I'm catching up to with you. Yeah, awesome, man. That's that's great. Haley says, love your music introduction. Thank you, because that is a home production, my friends. And flattery will get you everywhere with Pat Flynn. So thank you very much. All right. Mount Athos also says, my child woke me up out of a very dark, introspective time in my life. It's like he pulled me out of my darkness. That's why I named him Luke, which means light. Yeah. Nice. Nice. Beautiful story. Indeed. Indeed. Yeah, it does. It, it will wake you up in more ways than one, having a kid. Uh, and literally often in the middle of the night, too. So. All right. Sorry. Just scrolling through here. Yeah. Uh, someone asked something about uh, Wittgenstein. Yeah. Yeah. Uh... Oops, that screws up there. We both clicked it at the same time. Simul click. Uh, Catholicism in the car. Um, do you have uh, any thoughts on Ludwig Wittgenstein's philosophy? I mean, look, I, I, 
I wrote my master's thesis on Wittgenstein and Sellers, right? Um, and like the 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 new book is like just suffused with Wittgenstein stuff. Um, maybe we'll figure out a text we could do on the show here by Wittgenstein because I don't I don't I, I love that people are asking about that, but I don't have like a three minute or on that. Do you know what I mean? Mm-hmm. So may, maybe we'll. Um, I'll try to come up with the problem with Wittgenstein is his texts are sticky messes. It's hard to excerpt anything, but we should come up with something to do in Wittgenstein. So we will. I bring yeah. this up just to like write a promissory note to the listener. Yeah. We got to finish Kant too, which we will do soon. Yeah, yeah, definitely. Mm-hmm. Just bouncing around here. Brendan says, I worked for musicians for like 10 years. Three hour sets are done, but they were clearly nuts. Good luck, man. Yeah, uh, three hour sets are nuts. Thank you for recognizing that. And uh, remember, this band is young. We've been only been together for a couple of months. So it's, uh, not only a long nutty set, but it's a lot of material we've had to get down in a short amount of time. So yeah. it's a, it's, it's a chore, Yeah, but it'll come together. It'll, it'll be good. Mm-hmm. Can I hit this one? Do you mind? Yeah, do it. So from uh, Tyler, my wife and I want to cultivate a culture of meaning, enchantment and tradition for our kids. Many people such as John senior suggest uh, you smash the TV. Uh, we think the approach uh, seems quite uh, myopic. Yeah. I agree. I mean, I also think that, you know, I've actually been reading a book about the development of television um, and like the, like as an intentional model for social control. And I think that's not a joke either. Right. So, right. Mm-hmm. but uh, I agree. And, and, and I think, and actually Tyler goes on here in the next question to follow up, like, what are your suggestions uh, on virtuously util- utilizing technology while trying to foster meaningful existence in your family with your kids? Does it simply uh, take continual self-examination and prudence? I mean, th- I think the answer to both questions is yes to that last sub question. Okay? For sure. And mm-hmm. so we, st- we started out with our kids um, almost zero. Right. I remember when they were really little, uh, we would go to the public library and there was a video Dave and Becky were the hosts and they would just go around to construction sites and like film dump, dump trucks. Okay. Mm-hmm. So when things got really bad, we like, <laughs> like crazy with the kids on like a hot summer day, we would like throw a Dave and Becky video on and they would like watch dump trucks for 20 minutes while, <laughs> awesome, while, my, <laughs> while like, like my wife and I would like split a fifth of scotch. Right. <laughs> <laughs> you know what I mean? You know? Here kids watch hard hat yeah. Harry for the next hour. Well, yeah, yeah, exactly. Yeah. yeah. You're like, Bob the builder at that point. Like here, just watch Bob the builder while, mm. while, while dad, you know, like gets his medicine. My dad <laughs> tries My dad drinks his angry juice. Right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Okay. Um, and so, so I do not drink anymore. Anyway, so, um, so, but so initially for us, like we used it just as like when when we were at our wits end, kind of like it was a tool, right? Um, and we really emphasized in our house for entertainment when the kids were little, uh, like read aloud, like you know. So I read, I'd never read any fantasy stuff before this i read all the narnia stuff aloud i read the lord of the rings multiple times aloud you know mm-hmm. read the hobbit multiple times aloud uh percy jackson uh count of monte cristo which i'm doing again right now for cormac our youngest okay so the read alouds are really big for entertainment right yep. but then slowly like we started like introducing like a movie a week mm-hmm. and that went pretty mm-hmm. well right um like for a long time the video game policy in the house was every kid got 15 minutes of video games a week and that was it Mm -hmm, right mm -hmm. um this is also when we would in the summers we wouldn't turn the air conditioning on so so that they would go outside right Right. yeah smart. okay stuff like that i love little tricks like that. yeah yeah Yeah. okay Uh and so but we found they also it was cool that they would take their 15 minutes of video kind video game time and pool it so that they would they would like play it in succession so they could like smart. advance the games. Yeah, it was smart mm-hmm. anyway. But then, you know, as they get older and they have a decent relationship to the technology, like we don't have an official video game policy. Right. Because they anymore. can auto-regulate well enough. They can right? auto-regulate mm-hmm. and they know, like they're, they're used to from their little, when I say turn off the video games, you turn the video games off, right? Mm-hmm. So now. Yeah, there's you know, no, oh, just five more minutes, right? Yeah, right. no, it's like, hey, I'll say, hey, how long you've been playing jack oh for 40 minutes well it should turn it off okay then it it gets turned off it's not like this constant struggle because we established that this isn't just the given background noise in our life that's exactly right right Right. Mm -hmm. um and now you know for instance you know we've we pretty much always have like a tv series going right Mm -hmm. like right now we're doing mythbusters 
Right. And we're doing Rockford Files. Nice. Yeah, you're doing Rockford Files. That's right? just me yeah. and my wife, not the kids. So. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, we just we just finished X Files. Our kids are older, but we. Just I want to I want to do X Files, but Christine, yeah. she won't she won't do it. Yeah. She, so yeah, I mean, but there we're looking at like maybe you know forty minutes, fifty minutes of TV, you know, several times a week. But it's so it's still probably far less screen time than like your normal, yeah, the normie households, right? Right. Um, but for this, it's just it's just constantly been you know. As, as Tyler puts it, like just prudential decisions we made based on where our kids are at and stuff like that. But the default we established in the house was that we're, we don't look to this as our primary kind of ed- entertainment. Right. right. And and mm-hmm. then we can work our way back from there. Right. Yes. Right. And as far as cell phone stuff goes, we don't, our kids don't get a cell phone until they can drive. Because mm-hmm. mm-hmm. right? then we mm-hmm. see there's a practical reason for them to have it. Yep. Right? Yep. Um, and at that point they're 16 years old and like our attitude is like, Hey man, they're like, there's not much we can do here if right. there's something not right. And to, hopefully, to anymore, hopefully yeah. you've done your job. Hopefully well you've done our job. Point, and at yeah. a certain point, I think they have a right to a private life too. Right. Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. You know what I mean? So they know though, you know, like there's no passwords that we can't get to and stuff like that. But you know, mm-hmm. once again, it's not, we're not running a police state and I don't think we have to, cause we did our work to get, get that's here. right. Yeah. Cause yeah. what you did in those first 16 yeah. years matters. So yeah. that's all brilliant. I don't, I mean, ours is not too different than that. I mean, same thing, like starting out, we were like almost nothing. And again, as, as we've learned and, and, you know, yeah. uh, gotten more experience and hopefully prudence over time, similar things like the default is not screen we don't have cable first off like absolutely yeah, no yeah, cable yeah. no cell phones no social media any of that i think you'd be insane to let your kids have social media like yeah. before they're like it, yeah even when they're teenagers like yeah. 16 i think is a good age driving i like that but my kids aren't that old yet so um and then we also have other like little rules like you know all of our kids have daily chores and assignments that they have to yeah. do that before they can even ask for any of their privileges all that stuff has to be done it has to be all checked <laughs> yeah, right, off, right? right and yeah. if they ask before it's all done and checked off it's an automatic none of the fun stuff for the weekend right so like yeah. we're we're pretty we're pretty strict right like yeah but, oh, but yeah, like yeah, yeah. It, it, it trains them not to bug not to nag to get in yeah. the habit to get their piano done their chores to play outside they have workouts too our kids you know, yeah. work out together and they do group workouts it's really cool but like that's the rule like if you even ask to play Mario before all those boxes are checked, then there's no Mario this weekend. Right? Yeah, exactly. Yeah, you've, you've screwed it up. Yeah. yeah. Did, did I ever tell you about the naughty chart? No, but I like this idea. Okay, so, <laughs> um, so there are two, two things that Jen did among the many brilliant things she's done. These are two of the brilliant things she did. Right. Mm-hmm. So first of all, for years and years, our house had promulgated rules posted on the refrigerator, like five. It was like, you know, like never speak harshly to another member of the family you know always obey mom and dad you know it's the kind of base like fundamental the natural law of the household right yeah and so if somebody did something wrong like like we go to the fridge and say oh i believe you have violated rule three right (laughs) and this seemed to make a huge difference and it was in print on the fridge i mean okay but jen also had something called the naughty chart okay and like so so each kid had a row on the naughty chart Mm -hmm. and there were levels of like you know i guess like you know infraction right yeah yeah yeah. and so there's like just your baseline you're not in trouble and then like if you did something wrong like you clicked up one column on the naughty chart it was like a magnet thing on the fridge Mm -hmm. and like the first thing was okay this this was like officially your warning right and then the next thing was, you know, loss of, you know, like, like family TV time that day. Right. Mm-hmm. The next one was like early bedtime. Like the next one was like loss of dessert. Right. Yeah. 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 Um, <laughs> and then like, like the, at the end of the thing, there was something called blackout. Right. Which we, actually we got from Black. Ray Garendi. Yeah. We got from Ray Garendi, <laughs> the, the Catholic uh, family psych guy. Uh-huh. And blackout was like, you're, you're in bed for 24 hours. Like you can get up <laughs> to the bathroom and like to eat a PB and J sandwich, but that's it. Right. And it, right. It, it went to blackout, I think, only twice in family history. <laughs> yeah, right. because right. blackout's effective. Nobody when you look to go to blackout again. Blackout. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Right, 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 right. And anyway, and so one of the things on, on the naughty chart was lost. We've done something dessert. close to blackout once yeah. and it, yeah. blackout has not been reached again, right? Exactly. Yeah. exactly. It's and the rest of them like, I don't want that. It's yeah. like, it's like, <laughs> oh hell no. Yeah. Like why do we why do we bomb Japan to show that we would do it? <laughs> you know. Mm. Um and so uh but like a lot of times they're like, like we generally wouldn't have dessert on like a Tuesday night. Right. 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 So like Jen would just keep these like just cheap, like, you know, like fruit and syrup cups you can get with the yeah. peel off mm-hmm. top. Like just keep those in, in the, uh, 
in, in the in the cupboard. So like if you know Patrick, my son Patrick, he was naughty that day and he lost dessert, and it turns out it's fruit cup night. It's it's Tuesday fruit cup. Who night. knew? Who right. knew? It, you didn't know it's fruit cup night. Well, I'm sorry, you shouldn't have been naughty because now you don't get dessert, and it just turns out you hit it on dessert day because <laughs> you did have. It's, so done so better, right? We would declare it was fruit cup night because somebody lost dessert. We were endowing dessert simply because somebody lost it. Right. right. No, dude, I've definitely and, pulled that and, before. Yeah. And then we and, well, not like, with fruit cups, it was something else. Yeah, right? And yeah. we would make the malefactor like stand in the corner while the rest of the kids ate their fruit cup. Right. Mm-hmm. And the other kids, you thought they were being given this feast because the commodity <laughs> got more valuable because someone else didn't get someone it. Someone else right? didn't get it, right? Yeah. And it was deeply valuable, the only one who didn't get it. So I tell you, man, loss of fruit cup. Like Makes kept all- order in our household for 15 years. And it's not it's not yeah. even the fruit cup, man. Let me tell you, there is a real pain of missing out, yes. right? There's a real yes. pain. Um, so yeah, these are I hope these little parenting tricks are helpful to people here because this, this stuff is you kind of you kind of almost learn it by accident. You kind of stumble yeah. in these things. You're yeah, like, oh, exactly. That's, no, I, that was like, that was a good one. The fruit you'll cup. have to find <laughs> what the fruit cup is for your household, right? Right. right. Yeah, yeah, yeah. That was that was huge for us, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, there's always the easy ones. There's just ice cream, right? That always that always that always does it. All right, let's uh, let's take a few more here. Pope uh, Pope Stealth says, any recommended commentators for Plato? Who do you got for us here, Jim? Who are your favorite commentators? Oh man, I haven't read nearly enough Plato commentary. I read a lot more Aristotle yeah. commentators. Than I do Plato because I find Plato yeah. is just a lot more accessible than yeah. Aristotle. Right? Yeah. Mm-hmm. Um, I mean, I, I I'm always a big fan of C. D. C. Reeve. He has he has a book on Plato's political philosophy, which I think is pretty fascinating. Mm-hmm. Um, I think if you really want to get uh, a, a kind of a spookier read. Though Reeve reads played on a fairly spooky way, way, but if you really want to go with that, uh, you might check out some of the stuff by uh, Strauss. Uh, Strauss, um, that's out there. That's interesting. Um, but beyond that, I have not read a lot of commentary on Plato. I just, I, I just read and reread Plato, and, and I find the text starts to reveal itself. Yeah. Right. Yeah. Yeah. Um, by the way, the brief introduction to Aristotle is phenomenal. Oh, uh, yeah. The, uh, was it a quick immersion by Reeve? a quick immersion? Right. Yeah, oh so yeah. Gosh, isn't that, yeah. that's an incredible book. Yeah. Yeah. Has, has shifted my thought on, on Aristotle on a yeah. number of, on a number of physical aspects, actually, yeah. interestingly yeah. enough. No, I mean, uh, Reeve shows you an Aristotle that is, he's not like your grandpa's Aristotle, right? Right. And Aristotle's right. a lot funkier and spookier than you think he is. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. And, Jim, and Reeve I... brings out the interconnection of Aristotle's ethics and politics and metaphysics and psychology really well. Yeah. Right. So I know the question was about Plato, but yeah. I would just say, get that get that book on Aristotle if you don't yeah. have it already, gentle listeners. All right, Jim. Why don't you pick a? Sure. Let me see if I can find one here. Lots of, good, um... lots of good stuff today, my friends. Let's see here. I'm always bad at this, Pat. Sorry. That's all right. I know. Sometimes these things just get uh, appreciate all the good questions and comments here, my friends. This might be kind of redundant, but but I, I just kind of want to show solidarity. I agree. Keeping my children away from social media is getting more difficult as they can get older. But we're trying uh, to close the doors. Yeah, I mean, uh, now partly it's different because my my kids, you know, were all basically born before the the the, the smartphone revolution. Right. So, um, you know, and, and also we homeschooled ours to eighth grade. Right. So there was there was very little pressure for social media for them. Right. And Jen and I are not huge social media fans. Like I'm probably like more so into social media now than I have been, you know, when I was much younger. Um, but, but I'll say this is once like so it's funny when our kids get to high school, um, and then we give them we give them their phone and we give them the laptop and kind of turn them loose. None of them have really gotten into social media, right? Mm-hmm. They have various messaging apps they use with their friends. Uh, one of them, well, two of them had Facebook accounts. One of them has gotten rid of it, right? The other one, it's like a lark, like it's kind of a mm-hmm. joke, right? And it, like likes to show off about having four friends on Facebook, right? <laughs> okay. Right. Mm-hmm. Um, and so our kids, like the social media thing, didn't didn't really ingrain even once we turned them loose. And I think it's because they just weren't raised with it. Like the really formative years and like the, in like the preteens, it, they, they were aloof to it. Right. Uh, so I think if you can win the struggle at that point, I think the teen years with it will be much easier. Yeah. Yeah. Good point. Yeah. Here's one related to a, a recent series, Jim 
Stealth wants to know, do you see much compatibility with panpsychism and teleology? <laughs> okay, hold on, because I'm writing right now the third piece on um, on uh, panpsychism, and it's going to take up that issue, right? Mm -hmm. And kind of short story there is what I'm going to claim is what we really want in enchantment, right? Because because Goff claims to like he it, it's interesting he's I think he's worried about a lot of the right problems at the end of that book, uh, and he's worried about the disenchantment of the world, and he's worried about the nihilistic consequences of that. He sees a way to return to fix it is to like to give qualitative awareness to everything, okay? Which I think is just to take our truncated sense of self and like spread it out through nature. That's not yeah. going to help, right? Mm -hmm. um, what's distinct about mind is not qualitative awareness, right? It is, it's uh, it's normativity, mm -hmm. right? And so I think it's that notion of normativity, which I think you can only get in a kind of natural teleology that's missing. And I don't, whether it's consistent with, with panpsychism or not. Uh, Certainly panpsychism question. doesn't have a good grounding theory yeah, for it. Right? Exactly. Yeah. Like it's not, it's not integral to panpsychism. It's, it's mm -hmm. optional for panpsychism. I think Goff's a good, good evidence of that. Do you see mm -hmm. that? So the question you're, the, the listener's asking is exactly kind of the point I'm going to, in my third piece on Pat's like, cause I'm going to criticize it on. Yeah. Well, click subscribe and hit that alert bell. So you do not miss part number three. Exactly. All right. All right. Let's, uh, let's do one or two more and then we'll do announcements. And, uh, I got to actually, you got to head out, head out with the children here for a little bit. Um, there was one that I saw, I wanted to hit and now it has disappeared. Oh, it, it's, Oh, here's a, from stealth again what, what, what would you say is the most engaging piece of philosophy you've read well that's a really good and tough question <laughs> yeah, wow. engaging um, yeah man like what is the one that i guess has just like gripped me the most that you couldn't put down no matter how I, there's like a lot of books that were like that for me like within the first couple of pages you're just like this is going to be really significant right and like yeah. you go to bed late you wake up early just to get back to that book yeah. type of thing i mean all of Barry Miller's work did that for me. Pretty much all of Norris Clark's work did that for me. Um, I still get that way, even just reading parts of Aquinas. Not all of Aquinas, certainly. That would be not true. Um, Matthew's, Gr Matthew, Matthew's Grant's book actually is a, is a recent one. His one on um, human freedom and God's universal causality was one I just ripped through because I thought it was so good and so engaging and so in depth and tackling so many thorny issues. And I've read it again and again since. Yeah. In terms of modern works, that's that would be up there as well. Okay, I gave a few. How about you, Jim? So are we just doing stuff that like we've read in the last year or so? Or I, I guess you know. Here's I mean, because like one. Engaging... I have it right here. Look, here's a well-loved one that I've been returning to again and again. Uh, Neo Aristotelian perspectives and metaphysics. This one yeah. again, like start to finish. I loved all the essays in this. I found it super engaging. Yeah. I've come back to this time and time again. So, I mean, because yeah. certainly I could, I could like, I could always say the Republic, right? I could always say. You know, the first time I really got Aristotle's ideas, but that's all. Let's leave that aside. So I think let's just go with stuff that I've read in the last year, right? Uh, yeah. If, if you do the Republic, I'm doing Constellation of Philosophy. Yeah. I believe you know here, right? So, yeah. um, I guess in terms of the stuff I've read in the last year, like you know, I, uh, uh, Merleau Ponty's The Visible and the Invisible has like mm -hmm. just completely sucked me in, right? Um, I spent about a month immersed in that book, right, recently. Not not the place to begin for Merle Ponty, though, by the way. Right. Read Solace's lectures, right? Mm -hmm. Um Latour's uh, you know, my uh like Modernity Never Happened, right? Uh really blew me away. I, I that was definitely one where, when I was reading that, like I would go to bed looking forward to waking up at five to read that book. Yeah. Right. Um and also I've been, and I'm gonna once again be writing about this in the future here, is very taken with a lot of stuff by Graham Harmon. Like his tool being was the book I read this summer so far that I just could not put down. Right. Like I was, um, I remember, I mean, just looking forward to, uh, a two and a half hour wait at the, at Washington national airport, uh, uh, just so, cause I knew I could sit and read tool bean while I was there. Right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> you know what I mean? So, <laughs> so in just terms of recent stuff, that's stuff's really sucked me in. Right. Yeah. But, but awesome. as far as classic stuff, I don't know where to begin. Right. Yeah. Um, just get at, well, actually here, let me, 
take this one because Billy, this will be a final one. What's a good book to introduce philosophy to children? Mortimer Adler's books. Uh, in fact, uh, our children copyright his books. And by copyright, this is such a, an awesome practice that has com yeah. been completely lost where you just take a book and you handwrite it out. You literally copy the book, right? It, it helps with so much in terms of development. Um, not only can you sort of be a sponge to amazing prose and stylists if you pick the right uh, writers, but you're constantly going to be engaging, hopefully, very significant ideas. So I've chosen Adler and the kids enjoy him and they don't obviously don't understand everything in it. Some of his stuff is a little bit, you know, more advanced, but his his book, Six Great Ideas, Rona's copywriting right now, which is just an introduction to six great philosophical ideas like like justice, for example. It's an awesome, I think. Uh, accessible enough book for I'm one of the things I've approached with my children Jim is not to treat children like modern society treats children which is like imbeciles right mm -hmm. children are not imbeciles right they're children but they're not dumb right they can handle significant challenges right they can handle you pushing them and giving them stuff that they're it's it's above their level because they'll grapple with it and they'll they'll do pull-ups right they'll get to a yeah. higher level and it just has never made sense to me to just like constantly dumb things down to the most imbecilic level for children no get the kids are smart give them the stimulation help them tutor them and, and they'll be lifted up so we're using adler six great ideas 10 philosophical mistakes and his book how to read a book uh roan has he got through all the way through how to read a book and now he's on to six great ideas right now mm -hmm. any you want to plug in there jim i i have done nothing to introduce philosophy to my children <laughs> um partly because I, I have worries about uh, trying to make them be me when they grow up. Right. right. Mm -hmm. Um, and I, I, I do, um, you know, I, 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 the way, the way that's been addressed in our home is by con other kinds of, of, of artistic content that like raises points of conversation. Right. right. So mm -hmm. like, you know, reading, reading the count of Monte Cristo aloud to Cormac right now is, you know, a daily occasion for us to reflect and talk. Right. Yes. Mm -hmm. Um, I, but I have done nothing for my kids to like formally introduce them to like philosophy as a, as a genre or like an academic discipline. Right. right. Um, mm -hmm. and that I just, um, once again, I, I have worries about for me, like trying to like, uh, yeah. Cause I don't think everybody has to do it. I agree. Yeah, mm -hmm. totally. I mean? Totally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. And yeah, let me clarify, like I'm not having them read or copyright neo Aristotelian metaphysics with like hoping, right. Oh, I hope you guys are going to become, you know, uh, metaphysicians. <laughs> no, no I'm, I want them to read Adler because Adler is a great writer. He's a great communicator and he helps mm -hmm. you to think straight about the basic ideas that are important for becoming a good citizen. Like it's a basic philosophy that I think right. everybody should be exposed to whether they want to go further with that. That'll be you know remains to be seen of course and um the other thing I'll, I'll say with children is just like just take the questions your kids ask seriously kids ask great philosophical questions all the time if you want to introduce them into philosophy um you realize they're kind of already there you just have yep. to in, like spend time trying yeah. to you know al allow them to ask the questions and, and you know they'll they'll, they'll They'll ask like a deep, profound question. You'll be like five minutes of the answer, and then you realize they're looking out the window, right? Yeah. <laughs> right? But but at least you haven't and, told them to shut up, and you said these are good questions, and you've yeah. encouraged a philosophical attitude, right? Mm -hmm. Another thing too is like you know if I'm listening to a podcast on you know Merleau Ponty or you know um, you know Marxism or you know Plato or the Kennedy assassination, whatever, right? Um, my kids here too. Right. Do, you know what I mean? Like you're sort of just an open, you know, my view is if it's going in my head, I shouldn't really be afraid of it going in their head. And so once again, it constantly occasions discussion. Yeah. yeah. And I've said it before. One of my, one, one of, I go, one of my dad tricks, I don't know if you call it a trick is when we're playing Mario Kart, I'll put a audio book of Plato's Republic on in the background yeah. the dialogue. So it's just, it's there. It's in, it's in the atmosphere. Um, Shoot, there's one other thing I was going to say, and now it has completely flown out of my mind into non-existence. So too bad, so sad. All right, Jim, what do you want to announce before we close this one out? Uh, check out the Substack, J okay. JD Madden's newsletter. Uh, two two pieces on there on, on panpsychism. Uh, be another one going up next week, um, and then after that, then I think I'll just I'm going to hold myself on three on that. And I'm going to start another series on something at that point. So. But I will, I'm going to try to kind of keep up the weekly sub stack now. 
Yeah, so. sweet. Yeah, that's that's it's a good habit. Substack is an awesome platform. I've got like four drafts on there that I just need to polish up and yeah. hit publish on. So you'll probably get a flood of content from mine here soon. But I'll put the links to our Substacks yeah. here in the comment section so you guys can sub up. And, and always, okay. as always, uh, uh, we'll put the Gumroad link in in case somebody wants a uh, a course. Indeed. Help yourself to a nihilism course, my friends. And we will catch you next time. Adios. Next time.